when I was the stream, when I was the forest, when I was still the field. When I was every hoof, foot, fin, and wing. When I was the sky itself. No one ever asked me did I have a purpose? No one ever wondered, was there anything I might need? For there was nothing I could not love. It was when I left all we once were that the agony began. The fear and questions came. And I wept. I wept. and tears I had never known before. So I returned to the river. I returned to the mountains. I asked for their hand in marriage again. I begged, I begged to wed every object and creature. And when they accepted, God was ever present in my arms. And he did not say, where have you been? For then I knew my soul, every soul has always held him. I haven't spent much time reading Meister Eckhart's works before, but gosh, what a beautiful poem this is. You can just feel the raw emotions pouring through, from the bliss of being one with nature, to the agony of separation and identifying with the limited human body. From the joy of reuniting with God, to the sheer ecstasy of knowing he never left. This really is a mystical poem worth reading over and over and over until the wisdom gently sinks through and pervades our entire being. I will certainly do my best in trying to unravel and interpret this deep poem, but before I do, I wanted to take just a short moment to ask for your support in dropping a like and subscribing to this channel if you haven't already done so. It will really help me greatly in sharing these poems, teachings, and meditations to other souls like yourself who genuinely want to grow and awaken. And if you are already one of the many people who have subscribed to this channel, I just want to say thank you very much. 
You don't know how much it means to me and my efforts to bring more love and awareness through this channel. I really think we're getting somewhere and your help is making all the difference. So now let's dive into this poem and try to see what it's really all about. Meister Eckhart starts by mentioning a time when he was a stream, the forest, the field, and even the sky. While some of you might perceive this as a type of reincarnation or living previous lives in other forms, I think it's actually much simpler than that. You see, at our core, we are all from the same source and share the same spirit. The analogy that I like to use, which is frequently found in Sufism and other spiritual teachings, is that we are all part of one great big ocean. You can call this ocean source, consciousness, God, the universe. It really doesn't matter. What matters is this understanding of oneness and the fact that we are not separate beings living separate lives in separate timelines. We are all one in the same. Our outward appearances might differ like night and day, but who we are on the inside is always the same. And I don't mean this just from the standpoint of our bones, organs, and vital systems, but rather something deeper than that. We all share the same soul, the same spirit. To go back to the ocean analogy, every drop in the ocean is all the same. They all look the same, taste the same, and behave the same. They are so similar, in fact, that we cannot distinguish the individual drops from the entire ocean itself. When we see the ocean, we see the entire body of water, not all the little drops of water that make up the ocean. This is the awareness and insight we need to develop. Our soul lives in everyone and everything. There is no I or you, no we or them. There is no duality at all. This is what Meister Eckhart is referring to when he talks about being one with nature and sharing the same soul as everything and everyone in the universe. This understanding that he has developed through many years of spiritual growth has helped him see his true nature, not as a limited human being, but as part of an infinite being. But unfortunately, not all of us are at this stage right now. In fact, most of it, I would say, are far from it. We are so disconnected from our true nature from source, that we don't even know the truth anymore. We don't know what's real, what's meaningful, what's our actual essence. Because of this disconnect, this separation from source, we experience the greatest mental and emotional suffering. We may be successful, we may make good money, we may live in good homes and have loving families. But at the end of the day, if we are lacking a deep connection with source, we will still have this massive hole inside our hearts. This is why Meister Eckhart says that when he was one with nature, no one ever asked him about his purpose or his needs. No one was ever not worthy of his love. What does that really mean? 
Let's see if we can unpack this because I think there's a lot of spiritual gems here. Finding our identity and by extension our purpose is one of the greatest struggles we will ever face in life. It's something we all must go through with some of us experiencing more success at it than others. We try to find fulfillment in so many different things, whether that's our hobbies, career, charitable works, and so on. When in truth, we just have one purpose in life to reunite with source. Everything else can be derived from this single purpose, but we can't achieve true peace, love and happiness without this journey back home. That is why I sometimes like to distinguish between your life purpose and your divine purpose. Your life purpose can be different from someone else's and more often than not, it will evolve over time to include so many different things. But your divine purpose never changes and is shared by every single person that lives, has ever lived, or will ever live. We all have this divine purpose embedded in our soul, which tries so hard to make its presence felt and to help us wake up from the sleepy existence we all have been living. So focus less on finding your life purpose and spend more time fulfilling your divine purpose. Once you take care of the latter, the former will naturally take care of itself. Similarly, focus less on your own individual, personal, and human needs. Now, this doesn't mean to starve yourself, walk around naked, live on the streets, or to have no personal connections at all. At the end of the day, we are a soul living in a human body. And no matter how much we identify with the soul, we must still take care of the body. The point here is not to ignore or discard the body. The point is to detach yourself from the body. Don't think that it is the entirety of your existence. We will always have physical, social, emotional, and other needs that can't be ignored and should always be given proper care and attention. But on the other hand, life should never become a game of just fulfilling all of these needs and not paying attention to what really matters. There is something more to life than just identifying with our mortal mind and body. There is an infinite soul lying asleep in each and every one of us. And we all have the responsibility and dare I say inclination to wake this soul up. Of course, the soul is already awake. So I should rephrase it as having this burning desire to one day see our soul that has been here all this time. Now, the last part of this section is especially interesting and reveals a very beautiful truth. If you look at all forms of nature, they do a wonderful job of not discriminating in their distribution of love. In other words, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside what language you speak, what religion you have, or which country you were born in, the sun will still give you warmth, the rain will still grow your food, and the mountains will still provide you water. This is true love. This is love without any conditions. Such a love is so hard to find in this world, but this is exactly the kind of love the world needs. It's the love God has been showering on us all this time. 
but we have forgotten how to access and distribute this love. We have put conditions to our love. We will only love the things and people that satisfy our ego or illusionary self. From childhood, our ego has done quite a number in helping us judge and make sense of the world. It teaches us to only love those who have done a good deed or action for us and to hate those who have wronged us. It teaches us to love what brings us pleasure and to hate what brings us pain or what brings us a challenge of any kind. Once we came into this world and identified solely as a human body, we lost and forgot our ability to love unconditionally. But if we read this poem carefully, we'll see that true love should never have any conditions tied to it. If nature can love us unconditionally, and we are, in essence, all of nature, then how can we not love unconditionally? Even if we have turned our backs on nature and blindly followed our ego's whims and desires, nature still accepts us when we beg to wed every object and every creature. This reminds me of a beautiful quote that's often attributed to Hafiz. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Whether it was actually Hafiz who said that quote or not, you can't take anything away from the beauty and truth of this quote. A love that is unconditional can truly light the sky. It can light every heart and soul. But before we can get to this stage, we have to get through the agony, fear, and questions Meister Eckhart talks about. This agony or suffering didn't just come from nowhere. It has its roots, which means we can travel to these roots to actually address the suffering. All the mental and emotional suffering we endure in life started from losing our connection with Source and believing that we are just an ordinary and mortal being that lives and dies instead of the extraordinary and infinite being that is found in every person, every tree, every forest, and every field. This being, soul, or energy, whatever you want to call it, is found everywhere. But the key is if you can actually see it. Not necessarily with your two eyes, of course, but with your inner eye, your intuition, your soul. To be separated from Source is the greatest form of suffering we can ever endure. And it can live with us for an entire lifetime if we never awaken and actually return back to Source. We can quite literally weep tears we have never known before. If we just keep on living in this limited mindset that we are this person who has a name, a background, a story, and so forth. None of these roles or labels truly matter. All that matters is source and understanding that we are purely a part of source. If we can come to such understanding, we can end all of our suffering once and for all and return to the beauty, simplicity, and purity of nature. This, of course, doesn't mean going on a camping trip once in a while or taking a hike whenever you're free. 
That's not the kind of return to nature I'm talking about. I'm talking about truly developing a deep and powerful bond with nature. So much so that you begin to actually see your real home in nature. And that's because it is your real home. Now, I know you may not have been born in a forest, but your soul shares so much more in common with the forest than it does the city, the suburbs, or even the tiniest little towns and villages. You are the quiet and peaceful soul that lives and breathes in silence. But society and human conditioning have made you search for the next rush, the next activity, the next role, the next purpose. Pretty soon you find yourself so lost in these different roles and identities that you actually lose connection with your one and only true home. So go back to your roots. Go back to where it all started and you will finally be at peace. Your roots are none other than God. We all come from God and we shall all return to God. Some of us struggle and try to resist this inevitable journey. But the wise among us will realize this truth very early on and just flow with the process. In fact, they will even try to accelerate the process. They quickly lose interest in worldly and material things and want to spend more and more time alone to reconnect with God. Sometimes we even have to be careful because even our desire to return to God can actually be morphed by our ego to be just like any other desire, one that feeds the ego. In fact, you probably have seen many examples of this. I know that I certainly have of people who take pride in their spirituality or the fact that they meditate two hours a day, read a book a week, go to prayers all the time, or give to the poor and so on. It's all a show for them. But when we will realize that there is something beyond this world of desire, that is when we know that God has been with us all along. Yes, we feel separated from him, and that is often one of the best ways to describe the discomfort, pain, and agony we often experience. But the truth is that God has always been with everything and everyone, even though we often fail to see this. It's not so much that God has been away or that he is out of plain sight. On the contrary, he has never been more visible. It is we ourselves that have looked past what is appearing before our very eyes. God's reflection is found in every person, everything, and every corner of nature. But it's up to us to see this. And that is why I love this poem so much, because it covers the entire arc of the spiritual journey. We all start by living in complete love and bliss because we are in the constant company of God. But then we leave his presence, or so we think, to live this beautiful human life. We forget the good old times before life and struggle and struggle until we finally hit an epiphany or experience some sort of a spiritual awakening. Then, once we get a glimpse of that light, we gain some hope and try to return back to God and to have some level of peace, joy, love, and fulfillment. Until finally, we realize that all these things, all these qualities, have been with us the entire time because God has been with us the entire time. We needed to travel on the spiritual journey 
to realize and appreciate what we have had all this time. There is no way around it, but through it. This is when you have that big aha moment and realize that your soul and every soul has always held him. So I hope you guys enjoyed this poem and interpretation and found it both instructive and inspirational on your own spiritual journey. Please don't hesitate to drop a comment letting me know your thoughts, feelings, observations, and even questions when reading and trying to decipher this poem. Even though I, I may not be there in person with you, I want you to feel like you have the support to really understand these videos and to apply the wisdom they contain in your daily life. And I know that as this community continues to grow, you not only have my support, but that of anyone else who is watching and who may be on the same part of the journey as you are, because we are definitely not alone on this journey. But I thank you for spending some time today to really dive into this poem and to try to understand the deep and powerful message it is ultimately conveying. I know that your soul already understands this, but it's now just a matter of stepping back and letting it do its thing. So thank you again for watching, and I hope to see you again on another one of these videos.